This is a reading from an introduction to the devout life by St. Francis de Sales. Chapter 28, Rash Judgment. Judge not, that ye be not judged, were our Savior's words. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. And St. Paul says, Judge not before the time, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Rash judgments are most displeasing to God, and the judgments of men are rash, because men are not one another's judges, but therein usurp the office of our Lord. They are rash also, inasmuch as the chief guilt of sin depends upon the intention and thought of the heart, which is as the hidden things of darkness to us. And they are rash, because everyone has enough to do in judging himself, without presuming to judge his neighbor. It is just as necessary to judge ourselves as to refrain from judging others. For, as our blessed Lord forbids the latter, St. Paul enjoins the former, saying, If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31 But too often we reverse these precepts and continually do that which is forbidden, judging our neighbor, whilst that which is enjoined us, namely judging ourselves, we do but rarely. We must seek the motives of rash judgments in order to cure them. There are some whose dispositions are naturally bitter, unkindly, and harsh, and who accordingly are bitter and harsh in all their dealings, who, to use the words of the prophet, turn judgment into bitterness, and the fruit of justice into wormwood. Amos chapter 6, verse 12 always judging harshly to, of their neighbor. Such as these greatly need the treatment of a good spiritual physician, for inasmuch as this asperity is natural to them, it is very difficult to overcome. And although it is rather an imperfection than a sin, it is still dangerous from its tendency to rash judgment and evil speaking. Others judge harshly not out of bitterness, but from pride imagining that they exalt their own merit by depreciating that of others. Arrogant and presumptuous minds who admire themselves and are so exalted in their own estimation that all besides appear low and contemptible to them. It was the Pharisee that said, I am not as other men are, St. Luke chapter 18, verse 11. Some again have not this open pride, but they view the faults of others with some complacency in order to enhance their as they imagine, opposite virtues. This complacency is so secret and imperceptible that it requires a keen sight to discover it, and those who are subject to it are unconsciously so, unless it is shown to them. Others there are who readily judge their neighbors to be guilty of the vices to which they themselves are addicted, or similar ones, in order to excuse and flatter themselves and quiet their consciences with the vain thought that the multitude of criminals diminishes their own guilt. Others give way to rash judgments out of indulgence to their philosophical theories, which would fain search into men's characters and ways, and if unfortunately they are occasionally right in their judgment, it encourages, encourages them so that it is hard to wean them away from the habit. Others judge by feeling, always thinking well of those they like and ill of those they dislike except in the one case of jealousy, where excessive love leads a man to think ill of its subject. This jealousy is an impure, imperfect, disturbed, sickly love, which will, for a single look or smile, condemn those it loves as faithless. Again, fear, ambition, and similar weaknesses of the mind often tend to excite suspicion and rash judgment. What is the remedy? Those who drink the juice of the Ethiopian herb Ophusa imagine that on all sides they, are, they behold serpents and such horrible sights, and those who have imbibed pride, envy, ambition, and hatred see nothing but what to them appears bad and hateful. Accordingly, as the former to be cured must drink palm wine, so the latter should drink deeply of the holy wine of charity which will purge them from the corrupt humors which result in distorted judgments. Far from seeking out what is evil, charity dreads encountering it, 
and when she does meet it, she hides her face and strives not to see it. She shuts her eyes at the first sound of its approach, and then with holy simplicity believes that it was not sin itself, but only the shadow of sin. If she is forced to recognize it, then she makes haste to turn away and tries to forget it. Charity is the great cure of all evils, but of this above all. All things look yellow to him who has the jaundice. It is said that the cure for this complaint must be applied to the soles of the feet. Now the sin of rash judgment is a spiritual jaundice, which makes all things appear evil in the eyes of him who labors under it. And he who would be healed must apply the remedy not to his eyes, that is, his intellect, but to his affections, which are as the feet of his soul. If your heart is gentle, your judgment will be gentle. It is charitable. If it is charitable, your judgment will be so too. I will give you three striking examples. Isaac said that Rebekah was his sister, but, but when Abimelech saw him caressing her, he judged immediately that she was his wife. A malicious person might have supposed some less honorable connection, but Abimelech put the most charitable construction on what he saw. Genesis chapter 26. So should we always judge as favorably as possible of our neighbor. And if an action bears a hundred interpretations, we must adopt only the worthiest. The Blessed Virgin was with child, and St. Joseph knew it, but he also knew that she was holy, pure, and angelic, and could not imagine her to be guilty of sin. Therefore he left her to the judgment of God. Why did he thus? Scripture expressly says, because he was a just man. St. Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. The just man, when he can find no excuse for the action or intention of one whom hitherto he has esteemed, still refuses to condemn him, but rather leaves the judgment to God. Our crucified Savior, being unable to excuse the sin of those who crucified him, at least lessened the intensity by asserting their ignorance. St. Luke chapter 23 verse 34. If we cannot excuse sin, at least let us bespeak compassion for it, attributing it, attributing it to the least aggra aggravated cause that we can as to ignorance or infirmity. Are we then never to judge our neighbor? No, never, for it is God who judges criminals when brought to justice. It is true that he makes use of the voice of magistrates as his channel. They are his interpreters, and should judge only according to his judgments as being his oracles. But if they give judgment according to their own passions, then indeed they judge, and will themselves be judged, since it is forbidden to men, as men, to judge one another. We do not of necessity judge a matter because we see it, see or know it, for the scriptural sense of the word implies some uncertainty, small or great, real or apparent, to be overcome. Therefore, Holy Scripture says that those who believe not are condemned or judged already, because there is no doubt of their damnation. It is not always wrong to doubt our neighbors. We are forbidden to judge, not to doubt. But still, we should not indulge doubt or suspicion without great caution, and only in, so, and only in, in as far as these are based on reason and argument. Otherwise, our doubts and suspicions are rash. <coughs> if some suspicious person had seen Jacob embracing Rachel beside the well, Genesis chapter 29, or Rebekah receiving bracelets and earrings from Eleazar, who was a stranger, Genesis chapter 24, he would doubtless have looked on them with suspicion, and that without cause, for it is a rash suspicion which thinks ill of actions in themselves indifferent, unless circumstances give cause for mistrust. All those, then, who watch carefully over their consciences are little given to pass rash judgments. As the bee retires to her hive, as the bee retires to her hive in cloudy or foggy weather, so pious persons do not expend their thoughts on doubtful matters, nor upon the questionable proceedings of their neighbors, but rather avoid such and employ themselves in good resolutions. For their own amendment. It is a sign of an idle mind to take delight 
in examining the lives of others, always expecting such as are responsible for men's souls, whether in public or private, for it concerns their conscience to watch over and examine that of others. Let them fulfill their charge in all loving kindness, but all the more examine and judge themselves. Chapter 29 Detraction Rash judgments lead to disquiet, contempt for others, pride and self-complacency, and a hundred other evils, amongst which slander stands prominent, the very pest of society. Oh, for a live coal from off God's altar, wherewith to touch the lips of men, that their iniquity might be taken away, and their sin purged, even as the seraphim purified the mouth of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Whoever unjustly deprives his neighbor of his good name is guilty of sin, and is further bound to make reparation according to his slander. No man can enter heaven with another's goods, and of all worldly goods none is equal to a good reputation. Slander is a kind of murder, for we have three lives, the spiritual life, which consists of the grace of God, the corporal life, which is in the soul, and the civil life, which consists of our reputations. Sin destroys the first, death the second, and slander the third. But the slanderer is guilty of a triple murder with his tongue. He destroys his own soul and that of his hearer by a spiritual homicide and deprives the object of his slander of civil existence. St. Bernard says that Satan has hold both of the slanderer and of him who hearkens to slander. For, the, for that, he has the tongue of one and the ear of the other. David, speaking of slanderers, says, They have sharpened their tongues like serpents. Psalm 134, sorry, 139, verse 4. Aristotle says that the serpent's tongue is forked, having two points, and such is the tongue of the slanderer, who with one stroke wounds and poisons the ear of his listener and the reputation of and the reputation of him whom he slanders. I beseech you, therefore, never to speak ill of anyone, either directly or indirectly. Beware of falsely imputing crimes and sins to your neighbor, of disclosing his secret faults, of exaggerating those which are obvious, of interpreting good actions ill, of denying the good which you know to be in any way, or of maliciously concealing, concealing it or lessening it. For all these things grievously offend God. Above all, of falsely accusing another or denying the truth to his prejudice, which involves the double sin of falsehood and injury. The most refined and venomous slanderers are those who pretend to mean well or craftily insinuate their poison by means of jests and banter. I really love him very much, one will say, and altogether he is a good man, but in truth, he was wrong to commit that breach of trust. Or that woman is highly virtuous. It is a pity that she slipped once. And so on. Do you not perceive the artifice? The archer draws his arrow as near to him as possible, but his object is that it should fly the farther. And whilst these men seem willing to retain their slander within themselves, they really launch it, but the more fiercely. Slander in the shape of a jest is worse than all. For as hemlock is not in itself a quick poison, and an antidote may, be easily, may easily be found, yet when taken in wine it is incurable. And so slander, which by itself would go in at one ear and out at the other, remains in the mind of the listeners when it is dressed up in some clever or witty saying. The venom of asps is under their lips, David says, Psalm 124, verse 4. The sting of the asp is scarcely perceptible, scarcely perceptible, and only excites a trifling sensation. But let the system once receive the poison, and there is no longer any cure. Do not publish that such a man is a drunkard, a thief, or impure, because you have once known him guilty of such a thing. One act does not justify the name. The sun, the sun stood still once at Josue's command and another time it was darkened on account of our Savior's death. Yet no one would say that it was either dark or motionless. Noah and Lot were both drunk once, yet neither was a drunkard. 
Neither was St. Paul bloodthirsty because he once shed blood, nor a blasphemer because he had once blasphemed. Before a man deserves the epithet of vicious, he must be advanced in or accustomed to vice. Therefore it is unfair to call a man passionate or a thief because he has on some occasion been angry or dishonest. Even if a man has long been vicious, we run the risk of falsehood in calling him so. Simon the leper called Magdalene a sinner because she was formerly one. But he told a lie, for she was no longer a sinner, but a holy penitent, and our Savior himself undertook her defense. The proud Pharisee esteemed the publican as a great sinner, an unjust, an adulterer or extortioner, but he was strangely mistaken, for at, the very, for at that very time the publican was justified. Surely, if God's goodness is so great that in one instant we can obtain pardon and grace, how can we tell that he who was a sinner yesterday is the same today? Yesterday must not judge today, nor today yesterday. It is the last day which will give the final verdict. Thus, we can never pronounce a man to be wicked without danger of falsehood. If we must needs speak, we must say that he has been guilty of such an evil deed at such a time he misconducted himself, or he is now doing so. But we should not condemn today because of yesterday, nor yesterday because of today, still less tomorrow. But whilst you give good heed to speak no evil concerning your neighbor, beware of falling into the opposite extreme, as some do, who, seeking to avoid slander, praise vice. If you come in the way of a downright slanderer, do not defend him by calling him frank and honest spoken. Do not miscall dangerous freedoms by the name of simplicity and easiness, or call disobedience zeal, or arrogance self-respect. Do not fly from slander into flattery and indulgence of vice, but call evil, evil, without hesitation, and blame that which is blamable. By this means you will glorify God. I would add certain conditions. When you blame the vices of another, consider whether it is profitable or useful to those who hear to do so. Thus, to dwell upon profligacy before, young, before the young is dangerous. It is safer simply to condemn everything of the sort, avoiding details. Again, if you chance to be the leading person in society when such subjects are named, and your silence would give you an appearance of approving vice, then you should speak. If on the contrary you are an insignificant member of the company, do not assume the censorship. Above all, you must be exceedingly exact in what you say. Your tongue, when you speak of your neighbor, is as a knife in the hand of the surgeon. who is going to cut between the nerves and tendons. Your stroke must be accurate, and neither deeper nor slighter than what is needed. And whilst you blame the sin, always spare the sinner as much as possible. We may speak freely of notorious and infamous sinners, but still with charity and compassion, avoiding arrogance and presumption, and not rejoicing in another's ill, which is the sure sign of an evil, cruel heart. Of the enemies of God and His Church, we must needs speak openly, since in charity we are bound to give the alarm whenever the wolf is found amongst the sheep. Everyone thinks himself at liberty to judge and censure princes, and to decry whole nations according to his inclinations. Do not indulge this failing. It is displeasing to God, and may involve you in numberless disputes. When you hear ill of anyone, Refute the accusation if you can do if you can in justice do so. If not, apologize for the accused on account of his intentions. And if even that fails, deal compassionately with him, remembering yourself and calling to the mind of others that those who are preserved from sin owe it only to the grace of God, and thus gently check the con the conversation, and if you can, mention something else favorable to the accused. <coughs> 